it's almost like the missionary movement. We're exactly in a place in history. We're in such an incredible time of a, of a, of a, aha, uh -huh. because it's like have, we're where the missionary movement was 50, 100, 200 years ago. If you're praying for people in Africa, if you're praying for the Asian, then this somebody would come in and talk about what God's doing and he's doing miracles and the, you know, the, there's these revival movements that were happening with mission bases. And if you were a real sold out believer and you were, you know, various stages of life, you'd look at each other and feel convicted by the spirit that your calling was to go. And that somehow you were either, and, you know, now we do our financial thing and it's like not even as dedicated as the, then they w put themselves in the offering plate and went. Cause they, cause the spirit of God was pressing it on. We're not feeling that pressure now. And it's unfortunate because the urgency is just as great for us to go into all the systems as it was for them to go into all the nations. Because what we've done is we've gone into all the nations so many times that you've got churches competing with each other for growth and their nations are tilting more and more into the chaos of dysfunctional democracies and verging into uh, Marxism or dictatorships and corrupt, uh, you know, democracies. And you think, well, what does that have to do with anything? It has to do with how the kingdom comes and how the will is done in some of the most fundamental ways possible. In Genesis 26, 18, it tells us Isaac dug again the wells of Abraham. Listen, I want you to hear some of this teaching. We're gonna start on this and then we'll just see where it goes. I get a call from a prophet, a friend of mine, um, who had just prophesied a word over, um, who had prophesied earlier a word over a U.S. Senator, a Senator who was reelected four times a state Senate in Georgia, named um, Michael Kratz. He gave this man a word while he was in business, while he was a realtor, and said that you are going to be um, in government and you're going to have a son named Caleb, and your son Caleb is going to have a future in politics. And, and what's funny is the guy was thinking about going into politics, but he was a wealthy real estate guy. Well, that prophetic word, his wife keeps nudging him, God spoke to you right there, that South African prophet. He gave you a word, you're going to be in politics. You're thinking about it, Michael. You got money, why don't you just do it? So he goes to run for office, and he's in, I guess it's Conyers, Georgia, mm -hmm. and he... Um, on, his, on the campaign trail, he, he uh, collapses with a heart attack. I want to go down and interview him and bring up film crooks. To me, this is the most fascinating story going on. It is, it is. And I'm talking to Kim Clements' secretary, distinct, I know her. And she says to me the story. She goes, Lance, she goes well, when he was, um, when he was, you know, after he had, had departed out of his body, there, the Lord showed him, there was like a large pool of water, I got the water partner, and out of it, there was a shaking and seven mountains emerged. And the Lord says, those are world kingdoms. And then one mountain came up above them, and that is my kingdom, and it's greater than all the kingdoms of this world. Wow. And then the finger of God pointed at the one in the middle, and the Lord said, and that is the government mountain, and you are called to go into it, but there must be agreement. And at that moment, he went back into his body. So he tells me his story. And I go, tell me about that, because I'm now preaching seven yeah. mountains. Sure. But what you have are the seven mind molds, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven mind molders that shape culture. The first one is the church. The church establishes a beachhead. The church is the religion mountain. Has to be, I call it religion, because if you're in Iran, it's going to be Islam, or Pakistan will be Islam. If you're in the Asian uh, China, it's going to be Buddhism. But the church, when the church establishes a beachhead, that is the first level of bringing a nation into the blessing of God by shaping and discipling the nation as a culture. What comes next after the, um, these are the mind molders of culture, the seven mountains is what I call it. The second category of influence is the family. For centuries, Jews have been able to retain their distinctiveness in any country. The United States, for instance, they've only been two and a half percent of our population. And yet Jewish people have shaped culture from uh, from science uh, to, you know, let's see, from Einstein to Bernstein to Seinfeld, from comedy to science to architecture to law. 
Jews have shaped the American culture. They've done it with only 2.5% of the population because they've been able to retain family and religious ties. So you can literally be a, a, a subculture within a larger culture and never deteriorate and protect yourself from what's out there if you can maintain your traditions, if you can maintain your values. And so it's the bar mitzvah, the baz mitzvah, and it's the family ties that has, been, has enabled Judaism to survive and not become a, a religion assimilated by other countries. They can coexist in any nation because they are able to hold on to church and family. After church and family, you have education. What's happened in the United States is we have yielded territory. You guys know this, but this picture puts it together. Harvard, Yale, Princeton. Christian universities and schools for the training of men and women of God. You can't even be a Christian on the campus hardly in those places anymore. I know I was protested and I just showed up to do one speech at Harvard. Because if you surrender these territories, here's what Jesus said. If a house is swept clean but not filled, it becomes seven times worse. And what's happening in America is there are seven institutional houses. Christianity once swept clean, but we didn't occupy it. And now we're watching in the place of Christianity a hostile takeover against Christians. Education from, from uh, kindergarten all the way to, uh, to college. Uh, the laws that are shaped by the courts come from the government. So you've got government and you've got laws right there in the middle. Media, we've just found out. What a powerful and dangerous thing it is when the press that is supposed to be the instrument of telling the truth on something becomes the ideologic instrument of a political party. So now you have media, laws and government, education, shaping the American narrative. And then you bring in arts and entertainment. So this would be everything from sports to, uh, to movies, to film, to plays. And this is the other insidious thing about what's happened in America. Progressives, those that have an ideology for America, it's almost like a counterfeit religion. It shows up everywhere. You can't watch a football game without finding a progressive agenda being protested in your face. So everywhere you look, you're going to start to see this philosophy coming over America in order to reshape America. And then you have business over here, which is your financial sector, advertising, marketing, and business. As business goes, all seven go, because that's the economic backbone of any nation. There you have the seven mountains that shape culture, the seven mind molders that have to be discipled. I go, so when do these seven mountains come out of the water? He goes, what? I got the seven mountains, the water, with the one kingdom being greater than all the kingdoms, and that's the kingdom. He goes, uh, and he's, I go, Senator, the, you know, the <laughs> mountain that comes up, and then yeah. the Lord says, that's, you're, you're called to go to the, in the government mountain, and, but there must be agreement. Agreement. Remember, you have to have agreement with the will of God. Oh, yeah. He goes, I'll tell you this. The Lord told me that I would only remember a part of what transpired uh, but uh, that, I can't, uh, where'd you hear that? I said, I get on the phone right away. I say, excuse me. I call up <laughs> my brother, the prophet, his secretary. I go, Debbie, what is this about the seven mountains, man? I'm preaching a whole heresy here. I'm telling yeah. Michael Kratz and this. She goes, uh, Dr. Lance, um, I don't know who you spoke to, but it wasn't me. I said, well, if it wasn't you, who was I talking to? At that moment, I thought, oh my God. Yeah. I could have been talking to an angel for all I know. Yeah, I have wow. no idea who I talked to, but whoever it was that I talked to. Because Michael Crutzer and I are still buddy. And in fact, he says, Lance, that seven mountains is the revelation of what God was really saying. I mean, he agrees that what yeah. I'm saying is actually yeah. what he got. But he said, it's amazing how that happened. He said, because I, there's parts of my visit to heaven I don't recall. I said, well, all I know is I asked for the background before I interviewed you, and I talked to someone who sounded exactly like Debbie Arnold at the number I dialed, and she denies culpability. So I said, but it's too late now because it's going out, and everybody's <laughs> saying Seven Mountains, yeah. and that's the actual origin of it. Wow. The challenge is the church, for the most part, has still not understood what is happening to America. And our default position is I fear to oversimplify the, the issue. Um, because it's more than just a battle 
with spiritual forces. It's a battle with spiritual forces that have released intelligence on how to storm the cockpit and take over the plane of a nation. And you will not affect what is happening in that cockpit unless you get there yourself. You know, I can feel people at home right now watching <laughs> and, and I can, they're going, you know, it's kind of like, what, what do we do now? What do I do now? What should I do? Yeah, well, here's the deal. I mean, the, the amazing thing to me is, first of all, the part that Michael had that I, I really love, and I love your, your radio circles here, stand in the sphere that God assigned you, hmm. wherever that is. And don't be surprised if God invites you into a sphere that is different than the one you're in. Now think about this. Donald Trump is in business, he's in entertainment, he was never in government. I could tell you a number of people, let's say Heidi Baker. So Heidi yep. Baker, kind of a famous um, missionary character, or like, you know, maybe a thousand churches. Who in the world would send a white Oxford graduate of theology to Mozambique, Africa? Right. To go Agreed. convert African men to the gospel. Only God would take a white blonde and yeah. send her to Mozambique. So if you take a look at William Carey, and you start to think about the irony of God, about how he'll take people, he'll take Paul, mm -hmm. who is arguably the most qualified Jewish scholar to convert a Jew, and say, you know what, go to the Gentiles. They don't know nothing about Judaism, they'd be perfect. <laughs> and then take Peter, who's an absolutely illiterate fisherman and say, go to the Jewish people and educate them. Yeah. So I would say, based on that, none of us are safe. Yeah. That God could call That's us right. to go anywhere. And uh, you can't say, well, I don't know how to do that. Cause it's like, well, then you'd be a perfect choice because you don't know how to do it. So I think the first thing is stand in the sphere you've got, be open to expanding the sphere into what God gave you. And, and get over the ignorance that comes with the seven mountain. The problem, the mischief about categorizing things is people go, well, that's, I'm over, I'm called over here to the church mountain. So they look at the church and, and this, and they're not called to um, arts or politics. But this is the big mistake. We're called to go into all the systems. And all the world is no longer just a geographic call to the heathen because Africa's yeah. probably more evangelized right that's now true. than uh, Rhode Island. Yeah. So uh, it's an actual call to go into a sphere of influence. So I say that the, the other thing we got to get over is that political, government, law, journalism, those are not the devil's territory. They, are, they belong to the kingdom of God. And if we don't go in, we shouldn't complain if the devil decides right. to take our seat on the, uh, on the flight. So the, the great story is the second day of the Civil War, the most momentous moment in history. You're a Civil War buff. Yep. Tell me about that. Yeah. The battle is going to be Gettysburg. Everybody knows that if Lee, Robert E. Lee, was undefeated, Chancellorsville, Fredericksburg, he's just undefeated. If he wins in Gettysburg, he's going to march on, on uh, Harrisburg or march on Washington. So the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg is going to determine what happens. And on that day, everybody's got their position carved out. This is a crazy, it's true, it's all history. And if you look down on the left line of the Union position, which is so meticulously dug in, there are signalmen up on a mountain, just kind of like we didn't have yeah. the, we didn't have radios back then. So there would be guys with flags going, they're over here. <laughs> there yeah. are, they're <laughs> yeah. there with, you know, artillery. So the Union uh, would be looking up there and there'd be like flaggers. And it just occurs at the same time to the Confederates and to the Union that entire mountain right there on the flank isn't occupied by anybody but people with flags. Why, if we, could, as you know, as Robert E. Lee says, if we could just go up on that little round top right there, that little mountain right there, if we could take that little top, we could artillery down the entire Union line. They'd have to back up, reform again, yeah. and it, the news would go out. They're, they're giving up ground in Gettysburg and they're retreating towards Washington. We'll go take Harrisburg.
So at the same moment when the Confederates are moving and swinging around to go up Little Round Top, there's a accident takes place. The, um, the a Union, uh, a word of knowledge hits a Union uh, colonel, Governor Warren. And he's looking out there in the horizon. He's feeling kind of uneasy. And he's looking up at the hill and he's looking out. And he tells a, 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 an artillery guy, he says, just fire randomly over there in that direction. And the moment he fires, all the brass turns in the direction of where the firing came from. And he can look through the woods and the sun hits an entire line. He goes, oh my God, they're, they're going here. So he grabs the first guy he can find, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, who ironically is a born again seminary rhetoric professor from Bowdoin College, Maine, who joined the war because he wanted to end slavery. But he's a Christian um, scholar. He's not a warrior. And he grabs him. He says, take that hill. Hold that ground. Under no circumstances, let it go. Joshua Chamberlain goes up, the 20th Maine. Boom. As the moment they show up, the Alabama regiment of Colonel, boom, they hit each other. I mean, the moment he arrives, they're already, mm. they, they confess, and it goes back and forth all day. And everybody's pinned down in combat, and they're all watching what's going to go up there. They run out of bullets. How are we fixed for ammunition? It's almost gone. Sir, we're running out. We don't have much left to shoot with. Some of the boys got nothing at all. Sir, sir, what do we do for ammunition? Sir, my boys have to take the muskets and they're back with them. Sir, we ought to pull out. He gets a word of knowledge. The Lord says, well, you'll just have to fix bayonets and move as one. We can't run away. If we stay here, we can't shoot. So let's fix bayonets. We'll have the advantage of moving down the hill. That's kind of a heroic thing to do when you yeah. can't shoot. But he said the secret is we do it in unity. What, you mean charge? Yes, but here's what we do. We're going to charge swinging down the hill. Just like we pulled back to this left side of the regiment, now we're going to swing it down. We swing like a door. We're going to sweep them down the hill just as they come up. Understand? Does everybody understand? Yes, yes sir. sir. OK, Ellis, you take the left wing. And when I give the command, I want the whole regiment to go forward, swinging down to the right. All right, sir. Fine. They swept down the mountain as the final assault came. And the uh, Confederates thought that another division had joined them because they were seeing them sweeping from the side of the mountain. They didn't realize there were the guys on the top swinging around. Yeah. They thought, oh my gosh, they got a, they've just been joined by another battalion. So they're surrendering, they're swept, and before they could figure out that it was out of bullets guys that did it with bayonets, it was too late in the day for an assault. And so they held Little Round Top. I'm telling you, the political arena right now is Little Round Top. Mm. All that to say this, that Christians that don't get involved, by the way, it was a remnant of participants at times in American history that determined the battle. 120 million people voted last right. time. The election was determined by 70,000. And it was Christians at the last minute who just decided to go this or do that. It's a fascinating piece of uh, political history. So where we are now, I'd say we have to look at Little Round Top and say those positions of district attorney, um, the attorney general for your state, the ones that are in charge of prosecuting cases, you've got people that are far smarter than you who have already bought those races and they're ready to come after you legally and with legislation. The only thing you could do is occupy the sphere you've got obey into the next sphere God calls you to, and everybody better take a look at Little Round Top right now. Yeah, see what's going on. Because that's where the action is. So, uh, looking at Little Round Top, I thought there's a great story, great, great comparison there, you know, where we're at as a nation and here in America. Now, uh, you know, this program, go, it goes around the world. We're in nations all over the place that so sort of watch, you know, typically American history, but also things that happen in other nations around the world during the histories of revival. So as they're coming in, everyone's watching America because it's the superpower, like it or not, you know, they're the superpower. Although, you know, we've got some real contenders out there militarily and everything else that's happening. What do you, what do you say to people, Lance, that are, they're believers, they want to pray. Is there a specific prayer direction that you tell people to pray for this election? Yeah, well, two, and there's two things. One is, as a friend of mine says who's from Dubai in the Middle East, he said, Lance, do you know why they call the Middle East the middle? 
eight. He said, I asked him why. He said, well, it's because on a map, it's in the middle. He said, America dominates the world. It's over here on the globe. He said, right. actually, we're, we're in the middle. And then there's the east over here. And uh, it just reminds us that well, even though for us, we're a bit narcissistic, it seems as though everything revolves around us. The reality is, I go around the world and I go to the Philippines, I go to Beijing. I've yeah. taught actually in communist academies there. And, and uh, so I've been in uh, Jakarta, Indonesia with Muslim companies working as a consultant. And the weirdest thing is CNN, why CNN? Of all the, the embarrassments, CNN is global. And so the whole world is watching our news. And that was, that's why, even though it's a bit narcissistic to always be American focused, it doesn't matter because America yeah. has a message. And unfortunately, because we aren't occupying the high place, little round top in media has already been taken. Yeah. Little round top in Hollywood has been taken. Little round top in academia, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, already taken. And we better wake up because we can't keep playing a retreat action. Those things actually used to belong to us. Yeah, that was our territory. Right. That was the North on that, not the South. Remember, God gives nations boundaries and a time period to exist if happily they might seek after him. 2015, God intervened. In 2016, he gave us mercy. And now in 2020, he's saying, don't think this experiment's going to go on indefinitely. Make up your mind now. Am I God? And uh, I believe that by October, November, by September, October, November, even though the battle and the debate in America has been, well, we're not a socialist nation, you're going to see socialism make its most delicious offer. Because uh, socialism is the promise of security if you'll trade your freedom so that the government can be more of a god in your life. And I believe that uh, if the church does its job, we won't see a total government takeover. We're going to see a reshaping and a remaking. And it's going to be... Uh, a battle, but it's a battle we can win because Ze in the Bible, Zerubbabel actually was awakened by the voice of the Lord. And so was the remnant. And the remnant built the house. And when they finished their assignment, Ezra came along with Nehemiah following, and they established the wall of sovereignty to preserve and protect the experiment of uh, Jerusalem itself. And God wants to preserve America because he's raising up sheep nations. So anyway, the, uh, the way to pray is, Lord, you want my nation to be your inheritance. That means, we appreciate people praying for the United States, you have to pray. Pray that mercy is gonna come to America. Amen. Because I don't believe it's by might or by power, but by God's spirit alone uh, that this thing's gonna change. Um, and we're just praying for the mercy of God because the mercy of God is ferocious and the mercy of God is what was given to us and mercy is for an extension of time. And the time is for your nation, other nations, to get it together. Learn from our mistakes. Um, we export um, faith and edification and revelation around the world. Unfortunately, we also export our culture, like I just said, around yeah. the world. And I'm afraid that not everything was done smart here either. And so we're exporting the decline of a great nation. So don't copy everything we do uh, and learn from our mistakes. And the first thing I'd say is, you got your own seven mountains. You better occupy them. You better occupy them. Because there's two kinds of nations when Jesus returns. And I, I love to talk with you guys about this, with Brother Copeland, because yeah. I really do think it's a fresh page for the church. We better go there. Yeah. And that yeah. is the end game. We're always focusing on the rapture. As though the greatest achievement we have is escaping. I mean, it's like, you know, like the Houdini <laughs> right. generation. Hey, look, we can get out of this fix. Uh, meanwhile, you know, Jesus says, occupy till I come. Yeah. So I don't know how we do both. How are we supposed to keep backing up and get out when we're supposed to occupy? But the idea is that I have promised uh, Psalm 2, that uh, the Lord has promised Jesus the inheritance of nations. I think we're playing fast and loose with the conditions of, of the return of the Lord. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. Well, I know that we've got preaching um, geographically in all the world, but I can tell you right now, there's people in the United States, you and I both know it, yep. they, know, they don't know born again from nothing. Right. They're illiterate. The people that are out there, millennials especially, out there raging, burning stuff down, screaming, you ask them, they don't even know who the founding fathers are. They, it's true. There's, there's functional illiteracy on Bible and history 
in most enlightened countries. So don't think we've got this thing covered yet. Here's what I would suggest. Nations have been promised to Jesus. He's going to have nations for his inheritance. We focus on the Antichrist, the beast, the one world government, and, and the rapture. You know why? Because we never had a corresponding revelation of the inheritance of Jesus of nations. He said, go make disciples of nations. When Jesus says, go make disciples of nations, it's like Brother Copeland's great sermon, let us cross over to the other side. I don't care what demonic storm comes and the waves taking over the yeah. ship and you think, or do you not care that we perish? It doesn't matter. He's on board the ship. The Word of God is going to provide Jesus with nations. Amen. And so somewhere, somewhere, somehow nations, why not your nation? And so when the Lord comes back, will, he, will there be faith? I don't know, but where there is faith, they're going to have a nation. Yeah. And it's, he's going to be happy because he's giving nations. Imagine how frustrated angels are. I had one guy who was an artist for Disney, Gene. He was, and before he left, he was, you know, they sign your life away. When you yeah. go with Disney, you cannot do another piece of artwork. And I led the God of the Lord in my church, and then Disney hires him. So he said, Pastor, before I sign the contract, I'm doing one more piece of art, and it's for you. And he's a brand new convert. He got saved on Christmas Day. My deacons wow. were so mad at me. I said, we've got to preach the gospel, even, even if only a few people come. Someone's going to be looking for a church on Christmas. They said, Pastor, nobody's going to go look for a church. I had eight, eight visitors, eight guests, eight people in my congregation, and one of them happened to have been this artist, David yeah. Murray. So, He's in, he gets saved, and, uh, and he gets hired by Disney shortly after. And he said, here's the last piece of art before I sign my life away to Disney, and I can't do art for anyone other than cartoons and animation. It's an angel. And Gene, I'm looking at him thinking, I never really got a chance to teach David enough, you know, let him to the Lord. But I said, David, this is a beautiful, beautiful picture. The angel is um, sitting. Now, I know <laughs> the, the angels, but the angels are... Flames of fire. I mean, I know there was one sitting on the rock there at the grave. I know right. with Jesus. So I, you've got an argument there. But when I think of my angel, I want to see an angel that's busy. I mean, yeah. I don't want someone sitting there taking time out, sipping a cool, you know, iced yeah. tea. Yeah. I said, this is, the, there are flames of fire going forth. He said, well, Pastor, I've been thinking about that. You know how you're preaching that our mission is to go into all the world, all the systems, and to go invade in every part of society and, and make disciples of those systems? Well, the way I look at it is a whole lot of Christians don't believe that, don't teach that, and don't know that. And so they're just kind of like waiting to, you know, trying to stay saved enough to go to heaven and get in the revivals of God. He said, I bet you their angels are kind of sitting there waiting for them to do something. Mm. He said, so that's what this picture is. He said, it's just the image God gave me of the angels that are waiting for a generation to do what it's called to do. Wow. I think there's angels right now waiting for nations to come in. I'm saying pray for mercy on America. Give us time. In the meantime, we're going to have to start to look at Little Round Top. Yeah. We have to move into our cultures and let the wisdom of God show us how to govern those spheres. Yeah, amen. And uh, that's, that's the prayer for every nation right now. That's good.